I want you to look at verse 30 in Proverbs 11. It says, the fruit, the fruit, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And, and then it just throws something foreign out of the clear blue sky. and says, now he that winneth souls is wise. Now, what's the last part of that got to do with the first part of that? The fruit of the righteous. Now, the two kinds of fruit mentioned in the Bible. One of them is uh, the uh, fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22, where it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those are worth a million dollars apiece to it. Now, in John 15, the first four or five verses keeps talking about the vines that bear fruit, and the vines that don't bear fruit, we're going to chop those off and throw them away, and we're going to cultivate and purge the ones that do so they'll bear much fruit. That passage is talking about us winning other people or producing fruit of our own kind. Now, it's normal when a man and wife, or a young man and a young woman get married and become man and wife, it is normal for them to reproduce and have babies. That's, that's just normal. Now, uh, when uh, the Bible says that uh, the Lord up in heaven is, uh, 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 he, he's the Father, and uh, the Bible says that Jesus is the bride of Christ, okay? Now, uh, no, I mean, it says we are the bride of Christ, I'm sorry. Now, and Jesus is the groom, and the Bible teaches that he's the groom, we're the bride. A proper relationship between the bride, Jesus, or the groom, Jesus, and the bride, me and you, will be fruit. And if we're not having any fruit, then something wrong, and it's not him. Is he, it's not him that can't bear fruit. And all those cases, I don't have time to go into this, all those cases the women in the Old Testament didn't have any babies, and that was a curse. And they all pleaded and begged God, oh, God, help me. Hannah just pleaded and cried, and they thought she was drunk when she went to church because she didn't have any babies. Now, now that's basically what this is talking about. It says the fruit of the righteous. Now, the question is, who's the righteous? The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not even one. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. Not a righteous person upon the earth. Now, when we're born, we're born with a sinful nature. And uh, we don't have any righteousness about us. But when we come to an understanding of the gospel and receive the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the payment for our sin, we invite him into our heart and we get saved. And now we have a part of us that has never been there before. We are now born again. And the Bible says now, uh, as newborn babes in Christ desire the sincere milk of the words, you might grow thereby. The uh, problem is that I've been growing all these years without him, and then when he comes in, I just have a little bit. All I know is those people I mentioned to the kids about Plato and Aristotle, Socrates, and Karl Marx, and Charles Darwin, and all those secular humanists, and I, I have been living my life according to what I want, what I think. Here's the way I look at it. This is my feeling about that thing, and I'm a humanist. But when Jesus comes in, I've got a little piece of me now that's going to go to heaven when it dies, okay? And that's the only part. My body's not going to go to heaven because it's under the curse. And if my body went to heaven, it'd mess up heaven and make it just like the earth. And God's not going to let that happen. And so when Jesus comes in. Now, I found out when I got saved on the assembly line at General Motors in 1950, that uh, when I got saved, I thought, now I'm going to float on cloud nine and I'm going to walk around on rose petals and it, all my troubles are over. I found out I was only one or two or three percent spiritual, but I was still 97, 98 percent carnal and worldly and, right. and sinful and all this. Now, I've been growing for 70 years now in grace and in the nurture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know what my percentage is. Everybody in this room is at a different level. We probably have some 10% Christian and 90% carnal here. If you haven't been saved long, you probably are struggling with a lot of problems. Now, we probably have some 20 and 80, and we have some 30 and 70, and we have some 60 and 40, and so, so on. Okay? Do you have any idea where you are, what your level is? If you are not saved, you're zero level. <laughs> Jesus is not in your heart. You don't have any spirituality about you. Right. It's all flesh and, and normal, normal, ordinary, but we, we're under the Adamic curse. And so when Jesus comes in, now, how do we get ourselves to grow? The Bible says, now, that which is born of God sinneth not. That's uh, 2 John verse 9. That which is born of God. And uh, there's a part of me that doesn't sin. Jesus in me is the hope of glory. In the Bible. Now, that's the part of me that's going to be able, that's the part of me that's righteous. 
the fruit of the righteous, that inner man is the only one that's going to have any interest in winning souls. Amen. My body could care less about that. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to embarrass people. And I'm nervous and I'm timid and I'm awkward about it. But the more spiritual I am, the easier it is. And the more I want to and the more I'll pursue how to study and how to give out tracts and how to talk to people and work with them. And it'll get to be a part of my life. And I've got to the place where it's the only thing I care about at 90. Amen. For the rest of my life, and I've got, I, I've t I made a bargain with the Lord when I hit 90. I got on my knees and said, Lord, if you're interested, I'll give you 10 more years. <laughs> 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 he took me up on it. <laughs> I, I got nine and a quarter years left. <laughs> okay. Okay. But here it says, the, the fruit of the righteous tree of life, and he that went to souls is wise. Now, the word wise is an interesting word, too. That word wise is the key word of the book of Proverbs. Okay. <clears throat> now, Jesus is omniscient. One of the bi biblical terms that we learn in Bible college, it says he knows everything there is to know. He knows everything there is to know about everything and has from all eternity past and eternity future, he has total knowledge, total wisdom. And the scripture is saying here, really, I'm going to paraphrase this and see if you can agree with me. The fruit of the righteous, a real sincere, genuine Christian, is a tree of life. He is alive when he was dead in trespasses and sin. And Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you hath he quickened or made alive or resurrected who were dead in your trespasses and sin. But when Jesus came in, you became alive. Amen. And there's a part of you who's alive and there's a part of you who's still dead. Okay. Now he says this, this person is a tree of life. He's alive. And he that went to souls is Christ-like. He's got something in harmony with, with Jesus. He is a person of spiritual discernment and wisdom. That's what this is saying. He that wins souls is like Christ. Amen. Okay? Yeah. All right, now, I want you to go to another place. I want you to go to Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, the more spiritual I am, the more Christ-like I'll be, and the simpler, easy it'll be. It just comes natural to help people and to want to help people. And I can get rid of the fear, I can get rid of the timidity, I can get rid of all my excuses, because this is something that all of us struggle with. Everybody has problems with bringing this up and talking about it. Now look at this in Daniel 12, it says in verse 1, At the time shall Michael, Michael was the eighth, one of the archangels, and he's the one that was sort of uh, taking care of things for the Jews. And it says, the great prince, Michael, which standeth for the children of thy people, the Jewish people, there shall be a time of trouble, that's the tribulation period, such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time, thy people, the Jews, shall be delivered. That's during the tribulation period. Every one that shall be found written in the book of life, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So this is the resurrection after uh, you know, at the uh, end of the day of grace, uh, we have the rapture and the resurrection. And then at the end of that period, we're going to have the resurrection of the unjust. So this is talking about the end times and the times of the resurrection. And it says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So in one resurrection, everybody's going to get uh, raised and go to heaven and they get reunited to the body, the believers. The unsaved are going to have to wait a thousand and seven years to come up out of their grave. So he's, he's including both up. And then in verse 3 it says, and listen carefully, they that be wise, okay, they that be Christ-like, they that have the same goal, same desire, same ambitions as Jesus. Now keep in mind, Colossians 2 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. So if I have Christ in me, I ought to let him tell me what's good and what's bad and what's right and what's wrong. And he will if I let him. And he says, now they that be like Christ, they that be wise, listen to what it says about them. They shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Amen. Now what's the firmament? Well, they tell us that uh, up above us is the cloud formation and the, all of the atmosphere is the firmament. And it says that these people that are like Jesus, these, we're talking about good Christians, sincere, honest Christians, people like us. People, we may not all know and we may not all do what we want to do, but we are sincere, genuine, and we wouldn't be in church today. Okay? And so they that be wise 
shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Okay? Now, that means that we're reflecting. We, we say, the sun shines, yeah, okay, and the moon shines. But he says these people are going to shine like the firmament. Now, they say that when the, uh, the sun, we, we don't think about the earth shining, the moon and the sun shine, but not the earth. But if you go out on the moon and take a picture like the astronaut did, you'll find out the earth does shine. It doesn't shine near as bright as the moon. It doesn't shine near as bright as the sun, but it shines. There is a distinction of illumination. Here's a little bit of shining, a little more, and a little more, okay? And it says here that these people who are real good Christians, they're going to shine like the firmament, but look what else it is. And they that turn many to righteousness, how do you do that? Well, if you turn somebody to righteousness, don't turn to me because there's none righteous, no, not one. Can't turn to me. Amen. The only righteous one, uh, Jesus said in John 16, 8, he says, Now it's expedient, it's necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But when he has come, he will convince the world or he will explain and give revelation to the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because you believe not on me. That's the basic sin that caused people to go to hell. They don't believe in Jesus. Don't trust him. Haven't turned it over to him. And not trusting him and believing in him. And of righteousness because I, the only righteous one that ever lived without sin, go to heaven. And this says, they that turn many to righteousness, we say it this way, I introduced that person to Jesus, righteous one. I led him to Christ. We have two or three terms we use like that. This is talking about you and me bringing people to Jesus. And he says, and they that turn many. Now, those the word many? A whole lot of people, they really get into it, and they have a lot of people, and they turn many to righteous. They introduce a lot of people to Jesus. And it says, they shall shine like stars forever and ever and ever. Amen. Stars? Yeah, they say our sun is one of the dim stars. And you go out there and look at the sun today, you'll burn your eye sockets out if you do it very long because of its brilliance. Now, this scripture is teaching us something that's very, very interesting and strange. But I want to tell you that what it's saying is that there's a distinction between an ordinary Christian who is going to shine like the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness who are going to shine like the stars. And when we get to heaven, according to this, and according to my interpretation of this, and I've, I've meditated a long time, I said, Lord, I don't want to tell people something that you're not saying here. But the Lord has shown me that this says that I'm going to be able to look at you and I'll know how many people are in heaven because you went out of your way to tell them or help them. And I can tell how many people have been saved because of your effect and your influence here upon the earth during the days that you were a Christian. Okay? Every one of us are going to shine. Now, now well, about 10,000 years from now, we can call all of us together again and, and we're going to have somebody here with a two or three watt face. <laughs> okay, here's somebody over here with a 10 or 12 watt face. There's a guy with 25 watt face. And here's, man, there's a guy with a 100 watt face. And here's a guy with a 500 watt face. Man, everybody. And according to this, if I understand this, there's going to be a degree of illumination. And we're going to carry it for eternity as a witness and testimony for how much we believed what the Bible says and gave ourselves to the teaching of the Bible instead of concentrating on how much money we made, what kind of house we live in, what kind of house we drive, what kind of retirement we had, and all the stuff that we give our total interest to. Wow. Things and stuff and us. Man. We And we are humanists. Now, it's not very complimentary, but, but the Bible wants to tell us if he gets spiritual. Now, he says, look, if you'll if you take me serious and do this, let me tell you, Seek first the kingdom of God, priority. Give God priority and let him build the spiritual nature in you. And he says, all these things will be added unto you. Right. He said, you'll have a better house, you'll have a bigger, better car, and you'll have a better job and a better insurance program and a better retirement program, and you'll have better health, and you'll have a better family life, and everything about it will be better if you'll just do what I tell you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. And so that's what he's saying now. Now, now he says, uh, if, you, if you just just do it, you will shine like stars. 
And I'll tell you, while we're having our meeting with a 400 watt uh, face and a 10 watt face, the 20 watt face, all of a sudden here comes this. It's getting lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And all of a sudden, uh, <coughs> D.L. Moody walks up. He won a million souls to Christ while he was here. Man, you talk about right. And then, and then in a few minutes, here comes a light that makes Moody look like a candle. The Apostle Paul comes walking up. Man. <laughs> okay. Now, 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 does your Bible say that? Am I seeing something that's not in the Bible? Are you going to have to prove to me a long time before I'm not going to be able to? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Now, I want you to go one more place. I want you to go to uh, Luke chapter 13. And in Luke 13, I want you to start with me in verse 6. It says, Jesus spake a parable. He spake a parable, also this parable, a certain man. Now, I want to identify this man as God. A certain man, God, had a fig tree. That fig tree is me and you. So here's this man. And in the story of the parable, now a parable is a story that Jesus would give uh, that was earthly in all of its uh, surroundings, but it has a heavenly application or meaning to it. And he says, now this is, there's a man who had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit. They're all, what kind of fruit? Well, uh, I mentioned two kinds. I mentioned the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and so on. And then I mentioned bearing fruit. I believe it includes both of them because I believe the first step is to get filled with the Spirit so that I have the fruit of the Spirit. And that will give the appeal that I need. Uh, that will give me the right expression, the right tone of voice. It will give me uh, the kind of an authority t uh, approach that people have confidence in me. And it will assist and help me to do the other thing. I think the fruit of the Spirit is going to be necessary in order to be a bear off fruits as far as winning souls. So it says that this person came and they, they came to the tree and there was no fruit. He sought fruit thereon and he found none. Well, he wasn't producing any fruit. So he said to the dresser of the vineyard, this is the intercessor. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the great high priest, the intercessor. And he says that first of all, the Lord came to his tree, that's me and you, and he was looking for fruit, didn't find any. And he said to the dresser to Jesus, Behold, these three years I come. We had a revival meeting and nothing happened. We had a Bible conference, nothing happened. And we had a soul winning conference, and nothing happened. And, and I don't find any fruit on it. The Lord says, cut the tree down. Well, cut it down? Yeah. Yeah, Daniel chapter 8, you interpret the Bible by the Bible, remember? And in the book of Daniel, it says Jesus was cut off. The, the tree was cut down. That's Jesus being crucified on the cross. So cut down means to snap off the life, okay? In John 15, it said, take the branches and throw them out into the fire, okay? So he says, okay, cut the tree down. Why cumbers it in the ground? It's just taking up space, filling up church seat, and, and the sinners can't come because it's full of... Okay, so, and he, he, he answered, he, Jesus answered, he said, Lord, Father, let it alone. Here we have intercession. Now, first, we have expectation. God expects these trees to bear fruit. Second, we have disappointment. There's no fruit on that tree. Third, there's judgment. Cut that tree down. Fourth, there's intercession. Please, please wait, Lord. Wait, wait, Father. And the Bible says Jesus makes intercession for us because he lives in our heart. And he says, let it alone this year. Let's put it on probation. Let's give it a chance. Okay, that's why I came down here. To tell you the Lord's going to put some of you on probation. Okay. <laughs> You're going to be glad when I go home, aren't you? <laughs> and he says, let it alone this year also, and I shall dig about it and dung it. He said, we're going to fertilize it. We're going to have a preacher come and talk about it. We're going to have a Bible conference. We're going to have a Revival meeting, and we're going to talk about this, and, and we're going to bring that truth out so you can understand this, because I love you, and I want you to know this so you can have life and bear fruit, and I want to pour out blessings on you, okay? Amen. And then in verse 8, he says, and, well, okay, the Father said, uh, if it bear fruit, uh, let it, he said, let it alone, and well, I'll dig about it and dung it, and if it bears fruit, if it starts bearing fruit, okay, well, that'll be great, that'll be wonderful, but... If not, if not, 
Then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Do you have anybody on probation in here? That's scary, isn't it? Okay. Now, now I am aware of how some feel because I've been where you are lots of times when Jack Howells is preaching and slamming his finger down in my face and, and, and saying, you need to be getting the barren fruit. Okay. And uh, I, got, I got to thinking about, uh, you, you know, how, how you, you know, this, we, we, when the preacher says, I'm going to talk to you about winning souls, we say, oh, goodness. Why doesn't he talk about the love of God and the joy of Jesus, you know? And, <laughs> you know why that, and I know we cringe, and I, when I preach on it, out, everybody starts tightening up. So what I want to do is some parable preaching. Uh, and uh, now Jesus would stop preaching doctrinal sermons and say, let me tell you a story. A certain man did this and a certain man did that. Now, parables are easy to listen to. And I want to give you a, a couple parables, okay? Uh, Andrew was walking down the road, and he said, there's his brother, Simon Peter, and he said, hey, hey, Peter, come here, Peter, we found him, we found him. You found who? We found the Messiah. Yeah, you've got to be kidding. No, he's here. Really, actually, he is Jesus of Nazareth. Really? And the Bible says that Andrew brought Simon Peter to Jesus, okay? And it's not long before we see Peter. Now, some things have happened in his life. And he stands up to the people, and uh, there's a big crowd of folks, and he starts preaching. And he says, folks, I want to tell you that Jesus is the Messiah, and he gives a gospel message. And he gives an invitation, and 3,000 people get saved at Pentecost. And the Bible says all of them got baptized, and every one of them joined the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. Okay. Okay. A few days later, they had another meeting, and 5,000 more got saved. I think the 3,000 were so excited, they went out and got the 5,000, won them to Christ, and brought them in. And they got baptized and joined the church. Now we got 8,000. And Josephus, the early Jewish historian, says that 20,000 people were saved and baptized the first week at Pentecost. And that 80,000 were members of that church in the first year. And I wanted to see that that all started with Andrew brought his brother one on one. Think potential. Now, I will never be able to get 3,000. But I get one that might do it. Okay. Okay. I could win a Simon Peter. Okay. I went to Mexico City to preach for Kevin Wynn. And uh, he said, Brother Wallace, won't you preach on Thursday night? He said, I'm not going to be there, but I'll have my people there. And my associates will help you. <clears throat> Kevin Wynn is a graduate of the Hiles Anderson College. And, and uh, he's down in Mexico City. been down there for about 40, 50 years now. And he's got eight or ten kids. And, and just uh, an old common, uh, ordinary kind of a, you know, stringy looking guy, you know. And uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, Brother Wallace, I'll have it all taken care of. Well, I got there on Thursday night. There was a 7,000-seat auditorium. They ran 96 big city buses. We had, uh, uh, there, there was 7,820 there in the service that night on Thursday night. I preached a simple message, gave an invitation, 722 came forward, and gave the heart to Christ, and 526 were baptized. Praise God. On Wednesday, on, that was on their midweek service. I called down there on Monday. They shipped me out of there on Saturday. Didn't want me to stay Sunday. <laughs> they didn't need me. They said, we don't need you Sunday. <laughs> I called down there and I said to one of the guys, that, I said, what, what happened on Sunday? Oh, he said, we had 12,725 on Sunday and, and there was 1,262 got saved and there was about 750 got baptized. And he said, it's every Sunday that way. Been going on that way for years now, every Sunday. I said, ah. I wish I had won Kevin Wynn. Yeah, right. I could never do what he's doing down there. He, he's, got, he's got 400 preacher boys that are being paid to go soul winning every day while they're in college. They go to school and then they go, and they've got a, a millionaire who's paying the salary for these boys. He sends a big check down there. And the Lord works that all out because he's getting it done, okay? But my point is, I could win a Kevin Wynn. But I couldn't get 
all those people and get those buildings built and get those buses and all that kind of thing. Think about that. There, there was a, a, a young boy, a teenage boy up in Boston area, and he got uh, weary of home life and all and trying to figure out what his life was all about. So he packed up and left his family, went down to Chicago and got him a job in a shoe store. And they were back in the, um, back in the stock room working, and there was a Sunday school teacher back there working by the name of Ed Kimball. And Ed Kimball uh, said to this 17 or 18 year old boy, uh, you gonna go to heaven when you die? And he said, I hope so, I don't know. And to make a long story short, you probably heard the story that Kimball won Moody to the Lord. And Moody won a million in his crusades. I couldn't win a million, but I could win a teenage boy to Christ. And God would make a Moody out of him, you see, again, that's what we're talking about. There was a woman by the name of Daisy, Daisy Hall. She's a little a kind of a country woman up in Louisville, Kentucky, teaching in a little Southern Baptist church out on a back road up there in Louisville. And uh, she had a, a little boy come in. It was a junior boy came in. And uh, she said, is everybody saved here? And boys all raised their hand but him. He'd never been there. Anybody that's not saved, he raised his hand. He didn't know what that was all about. So she, she took him aside and led him to Christ after the service. And she said, now, now, son, you need to go home and tell your mom and dad about this and ask if they would allow us to have you baptized. And uh, so the little boy went home, told his mom and dad what had happened and talked about baptism. And so mom and dad got dressed next Sunday and brought him to help him so he could get baptized. And when they heard the gospel, they came forward and gave their heart to the Lord too. And that little boy was Dr. Lee Robertson who built a great Highland Park Baptist Church and sent hundreds and hundreds of preachers out all over the mission fields of the world and uh, did a great, great work with the Tennessee Temple University that I graduated from. And so, but uh, and here, here's just a, a Sunday school woman, you know, who, what can I do? <laughs> you could win a boy to the Lord who will become a Dr. Lee Robertson. Amen. You see, if I can understand it that way. There was a fellow named Ernie Haybacker who worked on the assembly line at General Motors in Wilmington, Delaware. And there was a little young fella, <clears throat> 20 years old, went and got a job there by the name of Tom Wallace. And, and Tom Wallace sitting inside the car fixing upholstery, and Ernie Hebacher was outside putting the door handles on the Buicks, Oldsmobiles, and Pontiac. And he said, hey, Tom, if, how about if you'd get killed on the way home from work tonight, would you go to heaven? And I said, I hope I would. He said, don't you know? I said, no, I don't. He said, according to the Bible, you can be 100% sure you're going to go to heaven. Really? I said, really? He said, yeah, listen to this. And he gave me 1 John 5, and it says, These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye might know that you have eternal life. He said, see, right there you can know. Really? And he, he went on, he explained, one, two, three, four, gave me the simple gospel, just as we changed cars, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and after a few days. And boy, I got it on my mind, and I, got, I didn't know what was happening, but I got under conviction. And I went home, I slept in a room with three brothers, four of us, two and two beds. And, uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> he, and I didn't want these boys, these boys, my, my brothers, they would have mocked and laughed, made fun of me. And I didn't want them to see what I was doing, so I put my cover up over my head and prayed and asked the Lord to save me. <laughs> then I put my cover down, turned over, went to sleep. Next day I went down to the factory and I said, hey, hey, Ernie. Uh, Ernie, I did what you've been trying to get me to do. He said, what'd you do? I said, I prayed. He said, what'd you pray? I said, uh, well, uh, you know, I didn't know the language. I, I was awkward. I said, I, I, I prayed. He said, uh, well, what'd you pray? I said, uh, well, I asked Jesus to come in my heart. He said, did he do it? I said, you said he would. He said, no, no, no. The Bible says he would, remember? And when he said that, I said, you know, that's right. He said, now, according to the Bible, and this is God talking. Tom, do you believe the Bible? I said, well, I think I do. He said, according to the Bible, it says that what you did. You, he said, did you do what the Bible said? Yes. He said, did God do what he said? I said, yes. And do you know what? I got saved right there. Didn't you say you want to pray? God say you want to believe. Amen. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But do you know, I changed from hell to heaven just by believing. I hadn't quit any bad things, and I hadn't started doing any good things, and I hadn't been baptized, and I hadn't joined the church, and none of that. Because it is not by works of righteousness, which Amen. we have done, but according to His mercy hath He saved us. Amen. 
And uh, by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, Amen. not of works, lest any man should boast. Yeah. You know, my wife died after we'd been married for 52 years. And, and uh, a, a fellow, a missionary by the name of Don Sisk, had won a woman to the Lord up in Chicago years before. And uh, she and her husband had two girls, and those girls grew up. They got saved after Don led them to the Lord, and the girls went to Bible college. And uh, my kids all went to Bible college, and, and uh, her, that woman's husband died about the same time my wife died. And after a couple of years, Don Sis came to me, and he said, uh, Brother Wallace, I, I've got a woman that would make a perfect helpmeet for you. And I said, well, I'm not sure. I want a perfect help me. Man, I'm free. <laughs> I, can, I can go have meetings. I can come home when I want to, you know. And if a preacher wants to extend the meeting three or four days, I don't have to worry about what my wife thinks about it or not. <laughs> he said, well, let me tell you. He started telling me about her, you know. And, and, and I had been talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, now I don't know if you ever want me to have anybody else. It doesn't matter. Whatever you have is okay, and I just talked it over with the Lord, and the Lord just seemed to say to me, now you've been talking to me about this, and I'm working on this, now you look into this. So I worked out a deal where I could take her to dinner. I, I told him, I said, tell you what, you tell that lady, and I have no idea who she was, that you tell her that I am thinking about calling her and asking her to go to dinner with me, and if she uh, goes along with the idea, I'll do it and follow through and see what happens. But if she's not interested, then I'll cut it off. We'll not worry about it anymore. Well, <laughs> he called me. He said, uh, she, she'd like for you to call her. Okay, so I called her and bang, the rest of it's history. That's 16 years ago. <laughs> okay. But, but when we got married, I told her, I said, now I'll tell you what I want to do. Her name is Mary. I said, Mary, I want to take you to the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, if you've never been there, they've got nine acres under glass. They got a river running through the hotel. You can get in a boat and ride inside the hotel and down the river. And uh, <clears throat> now, it cost you $18 to park your car in the parking lot. <laughs> if you plan on staying all night, take your credit card. <laughs> but I, I made a reservation for a room, and we went over there and, uh, uh, on, on the first night of her honeymoon. Well, uh, her daughter had made uh, a little thing for the door, you know, uh, just married, please do not disturb, you know, type of a real cute little thing that she had. And she put, and we put it on the door. And the next morning, uh, we got ready to go out to breakfast, and uh, I opened the door. I heard a little noise, and I opened the door, and here was Joan, the maid, and she had our, our little deal there looking at it. She had it in her hands. And she said, I, 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 I wasn't going to take it. I, I, I was just looking at it. I said, that's okay, Joan, that's okay. Well, we just got married yesterday. And she said, oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? I said, and, and we are, uh, we're going down to Florida after tonight. She said, oh, that's wonderful. And I said, after that, I'm going over to Grand Cayman for three weeks. I was going over to replace a missionary. We're going to have a month-long honeymoon paid for by preachers and churches. And uh, so I said, I, we, 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 we're going down to Florida, and then we're going down to Grand Cayman. And then I said, and then we're going to go to heaven. She said, huh? <laughs> I said, are, are you going to go with us? Oh, she said, I don't, I don't think I'll get to go. I said, well, you can go if you want to. And to make a long story short, we stood there, both my wife and I stood there and won that sweet lady to the Lord. Amen. Now, you talk about a way to start a marriage off. Went in somebody to Christ the next day, okay? Yes, and we've kept that kind of a spiritual flavor in our marriage, and we've not had two seconds of problems. I mean, I'm talking about two seconds of problems in our 16 years of marriage. Now, that's not always true when you have a new, uh, you know, a marriage after a second marriage. But it, it, the Lord has put it together. She was a pastor's secretary for seven years in Chicago. So she understood and had to, you know, knew the rope. But anyway, I'm just saying, you know, <coughs> The Lord just will kind of just drop somebody in your lap if you're where you ought to be spiritually. And uh, now that, uh, that brings up a point. When we, when we got to, by the way, when we got to Grand Cayman, we won 35 in three weeks while we were there together. Okay. But the Lord just let it be a part of our life as well as our marriage. Now, uh, I preached up in um, Chicago and it was a pastor's meeting and it had a big student body in there along with a lot of pastors. 
and I preached on helping somebody get ready to go to heaven. And, and I said, now I'll tell you, uh, if we will uh, understand that it's not us doing it, it's not my personality, it's not my appearance, it's not my language, it's not my know-how, it's whether the Holy Spirit has opened up the occasion. If I have spent some time that morning saying, Lord, I'm available to and I want to give myself to you, and if you will, if you put somebody in my pathway today, uh, I'll, I'll try to do what I know how to do. And so I, I said, now, fellas, listen, this is not a matter of methodology. This is a matter of being in tune with God and having the Spirit flow through us. And I said, and I went on and on, and you, you gave us all any challenge. And I said, now, look, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what I've done over and over again. I'm going, to, I'm going to just say, Lord, right here I am. I'm available, and if you will show me somebody, I'll do everything in my power to help them sign up for heaven today or tomorrow or next week or whenever it is. And I said, now, I want to ask, how many of you right here now, you preachers and you students in this Christian school, how many of you to join me? And I said, now, we're not saying we're going to go out here and win somebody to Jesus. That's carnal. That's flesh. That's me doing it. No, no, no. Lord, here am I. Would you work through me to make this happen? And I said, if you'd, if you'd like to say that, would you stand up and... Boy, the preachers all got up, and then in the media, a lot of the students got up, and everything. the first thing you know, then, then there were about 50, 10 or 15 percent of them that didn't know what to do, so they stood up because everybody else was standing up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but by that, everybody. And I said, well, let's pray. Dear Lord, bless and help us now. Here we are, and we're going to trust you. We had a prayer of dedication. And, uh, okay, folks, let's go to lunch. Well, we went to lunch, and I was through, and they took me to the Midway Airport. And uh, now when I got on the plane, it was a southwest flight from Midway directly to Nashville. And uh, when I got on the plane, uh, I, uh, uh, because of age and because of a little problem with one of my hips, uh, I usually get on, uh, you know, per personally, what do you call it? Where you take a wheelchair and they'll let you on. Everybody else pays $25 to get to be one of the first 15. <laughs> I give the wheelchair man five bucks for a tip and I get on first ahead of all those other people. I know the ropes. <laughs> okay. But anyhow, I got on. And I always get the second seat on the left side on the aisle. And uh, I, I did come down here, and I'll do it going home again on a southwest flight. And uh, so I, I got on the plane, and the two stewardesses in the aisle, and here was a woman sitting on my row against the window. She's the only person on the plane. And uh, I said to her, you're going to Nashville? Yeah. I, I said, how come you're still on the flight? She said, "Cars out, and uh, I was in Los Angeles, and she said, that they're, they're, uh, they, they put me on this flight. I said, lady, they've got six flights, direct flights from Los Angeles to Nashville. Why would you come all the way to Chicago and then all the way down? She said, those flights were all full, and they didn't have any room on there. And, and so they put me on this, and I sat down there, and she just dumped on me. She said, boy, I, 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 uh, my husband died about two months ago. And she said, I just couldn't hardly handle it. I just come apart at the seams. And she said, I got so sick, they put me in the hospital for a while. And then she said, I'll tell you, I said, I'm going to get out of California. And I said, that's a good idea. That's a good thing you can do. <laughs> she said, I have a lady friend down in Nashville. And I called her. I'm told, I'm going to come down and visit you for a few days. And she said, and so I got on this flight. And, and she just telling me, oh, my, all these problems. And I said, boy, woman, it sounds, you really got a lot of problems. I said, it sounds to me like you really need Jesus to help you with these. She said, I know I really do need Jesus. I sure wish I knew how I could get him. And I said, well, I kind of specialize in that. <laughs> so, so, you know, I talked to her a few minutes. And before the flight took off, we'd prayed together, and she gave her heart to the Lord. She thanked me 15 times by actual count. And then as soon as the plane landed, I got off. My wife was waiting, waiting and it was her birthday. And she said, uh, uh, what are you going to do for my birthday? I said, I already got that plan. I'm going to take you to the Cheesecake Factory on the way home. 
and we'll buy you a, a, a dinner and then get a big old piece of cheesecake for you, you know, for you. And so we get over there to the cheesecake and this beautiful young woman comes and she um, obviously was a little bit tired from standing on her feet all day waiting on people. And she came up and she did something very interesting. She got down on her knees and put her elbow on the table and said, now, can I take your order? And her name, well, I think, was Sue. I said, Sue, let me tell you a quick story about what happened on an airplane a few minutes ago. And I told her about that lady, and she started crying. She said, I, I sure do need to do that. I wish I could do that, too. Bang. <laughs> Got her. I took my wife to Outback the next Sunday. And when I got to Outback, a great big six foot two fellow by the name of Dan came and so helped me, got down on his knees. And I said, hey, Dan, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I didn't go after any of those people. The Lord gave me all three of those people because I had said, Lord, if you let me, I'll be glad to volunteer. I'm, I'm going to be waiting in the winds, you know, if you'll show me. And I've had that over and over and over and over. When I got on the plane yesterday, I said, Lord, probably between here and the hotel is somebody I can run into. And the guy that sat down me on the plane just wasn't the right guy. He just, you know, he had a mask on and he had stuff in his ears, you know, and, and he was over and I couldn't even, you know, I, I, we didn't even say hello. <laughs> I got off. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, we went to lunch together over here at a little restaurant somewhere, and Gabby came. And I said, Gabby, that's an interesting name. That's from Gabriel, right out of the Bible, isn't it? Well, and I said, we got a, a Gabby in our church. And I said, we had, well, our youth pastor had two girls, and one of them was named Angel. And when a little baby was born, uh, they were trying to get a name. And I said, why don't you call her Cherub and go along with Angel and Cherub? She said, no, no, we will call her Gabby. I said, no, no, don't do that, because they, they just put a guy in jail up in Nashville for 25 years. His name was Gabby. He'd been out killing people. I said, you don't want to name her after that guy. <laughs> but they, they did. They named her Gabby. But anyway, I was just telling this girl this story, and it just opened up, and first thing you know, we had her praying, and she got saved. And, and it, it just, the Lord will, if you it, you got to do it on purpose. you got to be thinking about it, okay? All right, now, I had... Um, uh, and let, let me add this now. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to where I need to wrap it up, but I've got about 472 stories for you, okay? <laughs> but I've got to hold them up, okay? But I had this young couple come to me, and the point of this is that uh, you don't have to be, uh, you know, a Charles Haddon Spurgeon or a Lee Robertson or a Dr. Robertson or a Dr. Hiles or a Rice or a Roloff. You don't have to be one of those people in order to do this. Uh, this, uh, this couple came and they said, could we have an appointment with you? And I said, well, sure you could. Uh, so we set it up for a Thursday night after visitation. So we launched our visitation and then the couple uh, met me and I took them into my office and they were just real sharp. Uh, seemed alert and quick, you know. And so I said, well, let's have prayer. And we prayed and I said, now what are we going to talk about? They said uh, they had been visiting the church and I had seen them. I said, are we here to talk about matrimony? Oh, no, no. They said, we're going to get married, but we can't do it here. We've got to do it over in Virginia where we live. And we'll. But I said, well, what are we going to talk about? They said, well, we've been attending a Bible study, study down at the University of Louisville. And they said, the man who's teaching this Bible study says that we ought not to get married yet. I said, really? What did, did he give you a reason? Yes, he said, <clears throat> he told us that we should not get married until we got born again. And then they looked at me and said, do you know anything about that? I said, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they said, could you help us? I said, okay. You know, now, now, now I, did, I did kindergarten way. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. God commends his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died and paid for our sin. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, do you, uh, you, you believe that? Yeah, you understand that? Yeah, okay. Now, if we do this, if we call upon the name of the Lord, does the Bible? Yes. If you prayed right now and asked the Lord, say, do you believe he would? Well, yes, he said it would. Yeah, it's just me. So, oh, all right, you pray, and I prayed with him, prayed with her. I said, now, Dave, Dave and Peggy, I said, Dave, do you believe Jesus is in your heart right now? Yeah, he said, he said, according to that, he'd be in there. Sharp. I said, Peggy, yes, sir, yes, sir. I said, if you die, if you go to heaven, absolutely, absolutely. 
boy, his shirt just set in. I said, Dave, uh, what are you studying down there at the university? He said, I'm getting a PhD in psychology next month. <laughs> Peggy, I'm getting one too. Two PhDs. If I'd known that, I'd have been over in Ezekiel, trying to lead them to the Lord with my wheels and the fire. <laughs> I've been in Revelation 6, trying to talk about those horses. This horse has a white tail and has 465 hairs in it. <laughs> and then, you know, we've been getting into that deep theological stuff. But here are these two HPs. They didn't need theology. They needed Jesus. Amen. See, the, the natural man, Dave and Peggy before they're saved, or you and me before we're saved, receives not the things of God, has no contact with God. I don't care how sincere you are. I don't care how many times you've gone to church or how many times you've confessed something to the Lord. Unless you have been born again, Jesus said, except you get born again, you cannot see or understand the kingdom of God. And unless you get born again, you cannot enter in and become a part of it. Okay? Okay. All right. I got to quit. I'm hungry. <laughs> but I'm going to do what I have done dozens and dozens and dozens of times, hundreds of times, really. I'm going to say, Lord, I have no, uh, no idea who I'm going to get to talk to. I don't know whether they're going to know all about it or whether they've never heard it before. But here I am, Lord. Would you let me help somebody sign up? I uh, had a guy by the name of Sam, big old teenage boy, about 18 years old, came walking up to me in, in a fair. I was standing out in front of a booth where one of our guys was giving out tracks. And this guy walked along and I said, uh, <clears throat> and usually I would say, hey, Bill. And he'd go, uh, no, Pete? Henry? No. Is it Joe? Is it Clyde? No, no, no. I said, well, what in the world is it? <laughs> in this case, it was Sam. <laughs> and I said, and we laugh because, uh, and it opens the door. But I said, uh, Sam, let me ask you something. Uh, are you, uh, you know, and, and, and he opened up. And I said, you know, one, two, three, four. And he was just listening. And I thought, boy, it's one of the easiest fellows I've had. And I said, uh, Sam, uh, let me ask you, if I prayed for you and asked Jesus to come into your heart, would you let me lead you in a prayer? And we'll ask the Lord, if he's not in your heart, to come in right now. And if your name's not in the book, you'd be able to get your name in God's book of life. He said, preacher, hold it a minute. He said, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that stuff. I said, Sam, you don't believe the Bible? No, I don't. He said, you don't believe there's a God? No, I don't. And boy, it just changed. I said, Sam, let me read your verse of scripture. I turned to Revelation 21 and 8. It said, but the, the, the liar and the whoremonger and the sorcerer and the unbeliever and you know, all them other, them other people, all the, shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth forever and forever. I said, Sam, you see what? You're an unbeliever, right? Yeah, yeah. I said, according to this, God's going to put you in the lake of fire along with whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars. How does that sound, Sam? He said, I'm pretty sure I believe I will pray that prayer with you. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord just has a way of putting it together. But, but anyhow, I'm going to say, Lord, I sure would like to help somebody sign up. But my, my chief line, the reason I brought that up was that I stand out sometimes I go to those fairs and work for a couple hours, and I'll, I'll tell folks, hey, listen, we are signing people up to go to heaven. Have you ever signed up to go to heaven? And uh, about half of them will say, uh, no, I don't know, I guess I haven't. You know, well, would you let me t tell you how you can sign up? And some of them will sit down with me. And, and, but uh, it's just a matter of in whatever situation I'm in, it's different in every case. But I'm going to say, Lord, would you let me, would you let me help somebody? And I don't know if I'm going to find somebody at a restaurant. Uh, <clears throat> I had, uh, I don't want to go on all day, but I had a real, real wealthy young couple that I had helped with their, uh, with, with all of it, salvation and growth and so forth. And they came and they said, Preacher, uh, I want to do something for you. And he handed me a whole handful of gift cards. Cracker Barrel, three or four, Cracker Barrel, three or four, the Steakhouse, three or four, to the Olive Garden, and so forth. He said, Preacher, we want to support you as a missionary to the restaurants to win souls, <laughs> win the waiters, win the waitresses. So, so I am a missionary to our restaurants, and we have two, 258 of them in our little town. So anyway, but Lord, here I am. If you'd let me, I'd be real happy to. Now, my question, of course, is <clears throat> would you join me? Let's bow our heads together if we can.